Welcome to the eLaborate Topics podcast, where we focus on lab-specific strategies for medical laboratory professionals. We're proud to be the healthcare detectives that work behind the scenes to get the results needed to influence medical decisions. Let's grow together and jump right into the lab. Welcome to Elaborate Topics Podcast. I'm Lona Small, your laboratory coach and consultant, and I'm so excited about today's episode. And today we have a round table with all of us today, the, all, all of the co-hosts, and Elaborate Topics is a weekly podcast where myself and my co-host, Taiwana Wilson, Stephanie Whitehead and other guests bring you topics and tools to help you to excel in your leadership and laboratory journey. And I'm excited to have us all today in a round table. And just to tell you a little bit more about elaborate topics, we are now over 150 episodes. We have a global, global audience of 50 countries and we have over 150. 50,000 downloads, and we are now three years and counting. Isn't that exciting, guys? Yes, I, I, I can't believe it's been that long and we've had that many episodes, but the impact keeps me fueled knowing that we are changing lives and helping people be better laboratorians just makes me super excited. So thank you to all of our listeners who tune in every week and who continue to connect with us and continue to reach out to us on topics you guys want to hear and things you guys want us to educate you on or uh, talk to you about. And let's keep the party going. So, so of course, you can all subscribe. Um, just go on directimpactbroadcasting.com or any of your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're sharing these out with your friends because we come with unique topics. It's not the usual technical topics. You can learn a lot that you would probably go get a mentor to help you with. We talk about a lot of leadership and other um, tools to help you to succeed in your journey. And today is no other day. We are going to talk about a very important topic, and that is carrier ladders. I know a lot of people are really curious about carrier ladders. And as I say, we always come to you with really unique topics that's going to be really helpful to you. So we're talking about carrier ladders enhancing retention and professional growth in the medical labs. I'm sure this is something that all labs want to do now when it comes to retention. So um, we're going to go right into it. Let me help you if you don't know. Just talk to you a little bit about what are career ladders. So basically, career ladders refer to a structured progression path within your lab. So they, uh, we set up various stages or level of advancement that make it available for employees. So you can move up. So basically these are defined steps, requirements and expectation to move up in your career. And it usually includes different um, job positions, different roles that build on each other. So it basically it allowed the employee to either acquire new skills, new experience, new qualification in order to move to the next level. And I know that's a big discussion among medical lab professionals. I did a poll um, last year and the question was, it was more like a survey. What, when it comes to identifying your next level career growth opportunity, what are your biggest challenges? And a lot of people, um, um, there were three um, top ones, um, finding the next level career growth options. A lot of people don't know what's next. Another one that came up was identifying the role that allows me to make that impact that I want. And then the next one was knowing the role that's right for me. 
And today we're gonna to help to answer some of those questions when we talk about career ladders. So it really does um, enhance um, retention in the lab. Um, so why is career ladder important? For one, when I talk about the definition, it actually helped with employee development because basically when those structure framework is outlined and the different steps, it's outlined certain qualifications, certain skills that's necessary to move to the next role. So it actually pushes employee to develop themselves in their career to move to that next step. Another, um, reason why it's important both to um, the organization and to the employee, because it helps with employee engagement and motivation. So um, a lot of times people are really, really motivated to grow because they know there's opportunity to grow. So with, within that, within your team, people are really motivated to move to the next level so they are performing at a certain level. They have certain goals in mind and they're performing at a certain level. So that does help with employee engagement. It also helps, of course, we talk about retention. So because there are defined steps to keep moving forward, people know that in the next five years, this is where I want to be. So you're, um, you're preparing yourself, you're growing, you're moving to the next step. So that does help with people staying because they know that there's this clear path for them to grow in, your, in the organization. And another thing we talk about, uh, we talk about several times is succession planning. So when you have that, this real clear path for people to grow, it's easy for succession planning. You know where people are in their growth. You know what next they uh, what's their next step. So somebody who may, I mean, in my organization, they call it a CLS four. That's after several years of growth and you're doing projects, you are ready because you're doing a lot of projects across your um, lab. So you may be ready for a technical um, role, like a technical specialist. So uh, when it comes to succession planning, people know exactly where you are, how prepared you are for the next role, and that's easy. So those are some of the important, um, why is it important? There's a lot more, um, but let me talk a little bit about the pros and the cons, because of course, with everything, there are um, pros and cons, and I'm gonna kind of mix that with certain benefits that you can get. So in terms of the pros, I'm gonna talk about some of the benefits also. So of course we talk about that clear path advancement. So people are clear, you're not like in this job and I don't know what next, where next I can go. And a lot of times when there's no clarity, people tend to get disillusioned and there's no direction and that can cause people to leave. So the great benefit of having a clear path for advancement is helpful, not only to the, um, the organization, but to the um, employees. Another benefit is goal setting and motivation. I talk about mo motivation. So um, employees are motivated to do more. Um, it's, uh, employees are motivated to set goal, personal goal for themselves, professional goal for themselves, and also to do more for the organization. Um, another thing is benefit is just reaping the rewards, um, recognition and rewards, getting the promotion, the salary um, increases, the additional responsibilities and different benefits that comes with it. And another great thing about um, Career Ladder is that in, as part of Career Ladder, there's a lot of development um, opportunities, hopefully that's um, part of this whole process. So in order to move to the next role, there are opportunity in terms of skill build, building and other professional um, opportunities that comes with that. And, um, 
And of course, the su succession planning and the employee engagement and commitment um, there. So those are some great pros. Um, so in terms of maybe cons, um, so one thing that I would say in terms of cons, because it's such a structured, um, the latter is more very structured and hierarchical. So for people who tend to be more innovative and want to create their own way um, or look at other things, that may not be an ideal thing because of that rigidity and that limited flexibility. Um, that could be a disadvantage for some people. Um, in terms of being stagnate, maybe it could cause some kind of stagnation in your career growth because some people may, you may have a career path and you have that top. In, in the lab, you get to that top and the top could be, depending on how you do your career ladder, could be a lab director. And you're like, okay, so what's the next step? It's not written, it's not clear what, go, what happened next. Am I moving out of the lab? Am I moving into um, other parts in the hospital? You're not clear. So there's this kind of a fixed ceiling. So there could be stagnation at some point, depending on how the career ladder is. Another con could be that competitive thing where there's a lot of frustration, where there are limited um, positions and people are kind of fighting. Um, or competing in not such a positive way, but in a negative way. And, um, you know, I just wanted to touch on some of those and I wanted to kind of get my, before I go in there, um, let me talk a little bit about job satisfaction and retention, because that is one of the big topic here. So as you see with those clear goals and progression and recognition and reward and um, opportunities for growth and development, and even with you kind of planning out your own path because you see it, you have that autonomy to decide where you want to go. That is great for job satisfaction and that is great for job retention. And I wanted to bring that out because that's such an important thing that most labs are looking for. And I'm gonna get my co-host to jump in and maybe I know it was a mouthful and um, get, you know, just get your feedback on the importance the pros and the cons and some of the benefits when it comes to employee retention and job satisfaction for career ladders. What are your thoughts, guys? I definitely think in our laboratory is a laboratory that implemented um, the career ladder, ladder um, a vertical model, um, probably six years ago. And I definitely think it has made our workforce a little bit stronger. Um, it's definitely allowed for some overlapping and the different responsibilities, especially the management responsibilities. Um, I think one of the pros that we found is, you know, you definitely have, especially when you see students coming straight out of their programs, those overzealous students who wanna come in and conquer the world and, you know, move straight from bench tech to director. And um, they, they want that pathway, like how can I, you know, sit in your seat tomorrow? And I definitely think it offers them some incremental growth. And so they can understand, you know, how to, um, they can see a pathway for incremental development in their career and growth um, and taking that off in bite sizes. And then they kind of understand the depth <laughs> of knowledge that they still have to gain. And they understand like the steps to, to start gaining those. It helps people understand what they don't know when they move into these positions, um, but then to gain that knowledge in small bites so they can be successful. Um, I also think it's just mutually beneficial for the employees and the organization. Ideally, as people grow through the clinical ladder, you're compensating them for each level uh, financially. So it's a benefit to the employee because they get more salary, but it's also a benefit to the organization because we have more people in the laboratory who can um, produce more work and do more projects. So that, you know, while your technical specialists or supervisors or managers might have been kind of 
weighed down by many validations and QC reviews um, and correlations, you're allowing somebody else who has the appropriate appropriate level of experience, years of experience and competency to do that, then your manager can do things that will enhance their team, rounding, coaching, um, conducting evaluations, uh, and all of those things. And so in a time where we are fighting a burnout situation and, and needing to um, support our staff uh, that we have during this workforce crisis. I think it's a different way to support management positions. Um, but I know Taiwana is the expert, so we'll let's, we'll hear what she has to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I will defer to your expertise, but I think everything that both of you said, uh, I think were great points. Those career ladders really adds for a transparent communication and pathway, because if we think about the traditional laboratory and the structure is relatively flat when you think about leadership opportunities. You might have your, your team lead, maybe a, a specialist, supervisor, manager, and director. It's in the traditional path as people think about it, but these career ladders gives additional opportunities for growth and advancement where you're able to get the skills that you need to be able to perform in those roles when they become available. So I think having that that pool of candidates that are prepared to assume these roles makes it better for your laboratory. It doesn't have to be just the, the team lead or technical specialist going out on cap inspections. You should have a pool of people that are able to do so. But I'm going to transition to more of the technical uh, steps that's needed uh, for this particular episode, because there could be managers out there that don't have a career ladder process set up in their laboratory and are thinking, how do I even get started? What does this look like? So as Lona was talking about pros and cons, I thought about that could be a con for some laboratories of getting started by not even knowing where to start, right? So I'm going to give you 10 steps to consider as you are thinking about implementing a career ladder in your medical laboratory. The first step is assessing the current roles and responsibilities, evaluating the existing roles and responsibilities of a given role in your lab, figuring out which roles, whether it's a medical laboratory scientist, whether it is one of your non-technical roles in which you would be wanting to implement a career ladder. Identify the skills, knowledge, and competencies required at each level within the career ladder. Step two would be define the career levels and criteria. Determine the different levels within the career ladder, such as if you were gonna use the medical laboratory scientist role, as medical laboratory scientists one, two, and three. Define the criteria for progression to each level, including educational qualifications, certifications, years of experience, and demonstrated skills. As you move to step three, establish a competency framework. Develop a framework that outlines the required skills and knowledge for each level. Identify specific technical and non-technical competencies relevant to that particular role. So don't just think the technical piece, also think the, the, the non-technical or the soft skills, the emotional intelligence, maybe the delegation if it's a, it involves projects. Step four would be creating the job descriptions and performance expectations. So you want to develop clear and detailed job descriptions for each career level, outline performance expectations and responsibilities associated with each level. Step five, communicate the career ladder framework. So you want to conduct meetings or workshops to communicate the career ladder framework to all of the personnel in your lab, especially at, as you determine who you would be rolling this out to, whether it's your medical lab science, scientists or your transfusion medicine team, whatever role you decide to start with for the career ladder. Explain the purpose, benefits, and opportunities provided by the career ladder. 
and address any concerns or questions raised by your employees. Because of course, they are going to have some questions as they think about progressing through the career ladder, any uh, financial or monetary uh, goals that are, are tied to that ladder. Step six, provide training and development opportunities, identifying the training programs, workshops, courses that can help the employees develop the necessary skills and competencies for progression. You wanna provide resources and support to the personnel to pursue professional development opportunities. Step seven would be implement performance evaluation and feedback establishing your performance evaluation system to assess employees' progress and eligibility for promotion. You also want to conduct regular performance reviews, providing constructive feedback and guidance to help the individuals as they advance in their career. Step eight, recognize and reward progression. So that's that whole, at what point are you tying a monetary uh, value to this effort. You wanna implement a recognition and reward system to celebrate employees' achievements and milestones within the career ladder. You wanna consider promotions, salary increases, or additional benefits as employees progress to higher levels. Step nine is monitor and review the career ladder. So you want to continuously monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the career ladder system. Seek feedback from employees to identify areas of improvement and make necessary adjustments to the framework. So that monitoring and reviewing the career ladder is very important. And understand that your first addition or, or first take or pass at the career ladder might not be your last uh, or final pass at the effort. So that program could get uh, updated and tweaked based off of the effectiveness of those that are going through the, the program. And then finally, step 10, you wanna have continual support and development. So providing that ongoing support, mentorship, and guidance to the personnel as they navigate their career progression and encouraging a culture of continuous learning and professional growth within the laboratory. So these are 10 kind of high level steps to think about as you are developing your process for implementing a career ladder in your medical laboratory, or even if you've implemented something, you could go back and see if there's areas where you may need to revisit, you may need to revise based off of some of the feedback you might have gotten from people that went through the program, or maybe your success of getting people through the ladder or moving up the ladder has not been uh, as successful as maybe you uh, may have thought. And then look at some of the metrics you can tie to this, employee retention. Think about those employees now that they have the career ladder opportunity that are staying within your organization. Think about when other leaders depart the, uh, the organization, if you have people that are ready to assume those roles. As we know, and we've talked about it before on this show, that onboarding and recruiting new staff is very expensive. So if you have these career ladders in your laboratory, then you're able to, to pull from that pool of candidates who's able to assume those roles. So those are the, the, the process that I would, would give high level process for a new manager or new lab that's thinking about instituting uh, this process in their lab. And I know that Stephanie has done this uh, for many years, and I'm sure that uh, the, the addition of their program today is probably not the same as it was uh, when they first started. But Stephanie, I would be curious to, to get some insight into your experience developing the program and you know where it was when you started versus where you are now and give us some insight from an administrator standpoint as well 
of some of those learning lessons or, you know, operational challenges that, that could have uh, arisen during this process. Because, you know, sometimes when we talk training and development, you know, it always comes with a cost. So it's that whole balancing, you know, productivity and, and meeting our metrics and not compromising that with also developing and training our staff. Yeah, of course. I think we went through, um, you know, 10 of the 10 steps and probably added a couple more, but all of the steps that you mentioned. So that's a very accumulative um, summation of really, you know, just a high level overview of how to implement a career ladder. And I would say, you know, for any laboratory out there who doesn't have a career ladder and you're thinking about implementing one, um, really look at your laboratory as a whole, the services you provide, um, where you guys might be vulnerable to stagnation, um, where, um, just like Taiwana said, looking at, you know, data, your employee engagement surveys, maybe your exit interview comments from employees who have left, where or the reason, what are the reasons why for low engagement? Um, is there limited growth opportunities? Um, and really, how can you benefit from this? Because there is, you know, there is a financial impact to implementing a career ladder and also maintaining a career ladder. Um, but there are, like we've talked about before, awesome pros. Um, so you want to make sure that your laboratory is free from vulnerability of people leaving. And we have those overlapping and alignment of duties like we talked about for, before. For our laboratory, I would say some definite lessons learned. Uh, one, our career ladder um, in 2018 looks nothing like it does now. Um, so <laughs> so continuously reviewing your career ladder um, is a must. Your career ladder should evolve as your laboratory does and as your recruitment experience does um, and as your team evolves. So I think there have been times where we have found that some elements of our career ladder were not only difficult to reach, but also it was limiting the number of candidates we were able to um, recruit. Um, I think some, apart, some aspects of our career ladder limited us from our pool of candidates, so we weren't able to cast a wide enough net. Um, and, you know, when you look across um, your laboratory and it's filled with, you know, level twos, is it too hard to reach the level three? You know, have you made your ladder into something that's either unobtainable or not reasonably attainable? Or perhaps you're just not providing all of those resources. For an example, um, in our blood bank, to achieve blood bank level three, um, we we um, asked for an SBB certification. Well, in Texas, um, at the time, there were only, I think, one to two um, programs where you could obtain an SBB, and none of them were in our local city. And so uh, we did the work as an organization to say, you know what, we can't require this of our employees if we're not doing something to aid you in accomplishing that standard. And so uh, we became a rotation site and we partnered with um, one of those existing programs on the didactic portion of the SBB. And then we hired a program director for the SBB. And so now we're, we're kind of have, have an S, a active SBB um, uh school or program at our laboratory. So definitely looking at what are some of the services you provide in your um, laboratory and how can you incorporate that into levels. Um, if you are not the decision maker in your laboratory, um, you definitely want to work closely with that person. Um, and then you both want to work very closely with human resources. Uh, we were fortunate in that there are other service lines um, outside of nursing that have career ladders, existing career ladders. And so this wasn't something completely like an anomaly to human resources when we when we brought this to them. Um, I believe radiology, pharmacy um, also have career ladders in their area. And so this wasn't something like that was a new idea to them. So they were open to the idea. And also, um, you know, that comes with, we've done episodes on inter departmental and inter, you know, inter-organizational um, relationships. So this is where you as a lab manager, as a lab director has to get out of the lab and start developing those relationships. So when you go to human resources, you've got colleagues there that are willing to assist you as you move through this process of implementing this. Um, I would definitely say uh, what has helped us make our 
our career ladder more well-rounded is we didn't only add technical requirements to our career ladder. And what that means is we added um, things like you had to have a specific score on your evaluation. Um, we didn't want a person who was a level three, but you know, having really low evaluation scores because they have tardies or a bunch of errors or something like that. Um, you have to have no uh, write-ups in in your evaluation year. Um, we we did lax that to say no write-ups that required a suspension. Um, but if you think about it, as a person increases in the ladder, these are people that your lower level technologists will look to for assistance um, and will look to for help in the absence of an actual leader. So if I'm you know, a phlebotomist level one or a technologist level one, and my supervisor's not around, I might go and ask the three a question because three implies that I, I know the answer. And so we want these, um, as you grow in the career ladder, we also want you to demonstrate that you can become a leader outside of the presence of, you know, the laboratory's actual leadership. Um, and so we built that in. We also built in the requirement that you had to be a part-time or full-time employee. You know, we love our PRNs. They help us in so many situations, but we want a person who is going to be invested in the growth of our laboratory. And if you've got a job elsewhere, um, then we understand that. But then we want to create those growth opportunities for those full-time and those uh, part-time employees that are already in our laboratory. Um, you did ask about benefits, and we started to see benefits to our retention and our um, employee engagement um, by codifying a clear path for growth pretty quickly. Um, we did have some individuals that, you know, qualified for higher levels, but did not want, did not want that. And so, you know, that was another HR lesson for us that so we started to document, you know, perhaps Stephanie, you have 10 years of experience and you have all these certifications, you have all these skills, you qualify to have this level, but you don't want it for whatever reason. So I'm going to have you sign this piece of paper to say, <laughs> I did approach you with that. So you can't go to human resources and, you know, maybe suggest that I, that I hadn't done that. Um, I would just say, you know, for anybody listening, helpful tips outside of reaching out to one of us for further information on the topic, you can always connect with us on our social media and we're, we're happy to continue to talk to you on this topic. But, um, one of the most helpful tips I would have out there for anybody is investigate what the titles and what um, other health systems might be doing in your surrounding area. You know, you don't want to be too far off in the job titles of, you know, maybe what your competitors are doing. You don't want to have like a super awesome validation tech and nobody else in your city <laughs> employs those or knows what that is. It kind of throws technologists off. You know, technologists are, are always out there searching and looking around. And so you want to make sure that you're kind of in line, but definitely look in your lab section and really consider um, a person who has three to five years of experience, five to 10 years of experience. What can they do in your laboratory besides run tests, besides draw blood, besides process samples? Um, do you feel that a person um, in your laboratory with um, the tests that you do and the operations that you have, do you feel like that person would be able to potentially prepare for an inspection? Like Taiwan said, go on an inspection, do a validation, review QC. Um, just with those levels of experience and with that competency and skill. And if so, you know, those are the type of things you want to start building into levels and start to understand where you can create bandwidth and depth. Um, definitely don't quit. It is a, a long process to implement, but um, I think we've um, kind of commented so far that it's definitely worth it. Um, what do you ladies think from what you've seen in your laboratories? Yeah, so um, I, I want to comment on Taiwan as um, so what was really important was the transparency that um, Taiwan has spoke about. So for years, we have had a career ladder that was not transparent to the employees. And we had a lot of complaints about not moving forward. So we went on a journey to create a career ladder about maybe five years ago. Mm -hmm. And we not only work with the med techs, but we worked with the lab tech. So we had a separate career ladder for phlebotomists and lab techs. We had for the med techs and different departments because 
I'm talking more about the core lab blood bank had theirs with different requirements. But the great thing was, especially for the lab techs, they could see that if I start out with X amount of experience, I'm at a P, I'm at a phlebotomy one or whatever. And then when I do my certification and do X amount of experience, I'll move to this level and I'll get X amount of money. So for them, it was important to be transparent and show it to them on paper. Another thing was great for the Medtex was once we had it on paper, because it's a lot of times people do it and they don't really sit down and work with HR and come up with um, things that are clear that the um, team could see. So when we had it on paper during onboarding, that was important to show um, the, the team the whole um, levels of um, where they can go so they can see opportunities for them staying at a certain time. Another thing I think that came up that I think that was um, really important is not just having the technical knowledge. So for us, we have like a CLS one, you may not, you may just be an MLT. A CLS two moved to an MT, but not the years of experience. And then you, they have certification and then you move up to three and then to four. But when you move to four, there has to be things like um, inspection, I'm working on projects, I'm working on validation, I'm working on things that may not be related to just your qualification as or years of experience. So I think those are really important points. Another thing I wanted to bring up was um, sometimes you can set a career ladder just in a specific area like the CLS. But I've seen where someone did a career ladder where you can show someone from high school, just in general, if you're in a small lab that you're not divided into blood bank, micro with different career ladder. So then if you go back to school, so those are professional development and do a two year, they actually have it written out and get an AA, this is where you could be. If you have your three year, this is where you could be. And they actually map it out from someone who come in maybe a smaller lab, that's more a generalist, so they can still see their progression. So that's really um, great. Just there's a lot of um, flexibility when it comes to designing a career ladder, depending on your size, depending on the um, discipline and so it you know there's some flexibility there yeah i think you all did a great you job a great covering it. i don't have a lot to add to that i would just say that transparency is very important in communicating having that ladder having that documented pathway so that people are know what's expected and know how to enter and or depart the the, the pathway i think is important I think Stephanie, you brought up a good point about if a person has opportunities, but they refuse to move forward, what do you do having that documentation, uh, evaluating what your laboratory needs and understand that maybe it is across all of your different uh, sections, or maybe it's not. So evaluating what are your needs and looking at what your local competitors are doing so that you are not making it uh, more difficult for yourself in the long run in regards to being able to recruit uh, additional talent. But those are the things that I would add. I think uh, both of you gave some great insight into uh, career ladders and it really just spoke to me about career ladders looking different and that flexibility depending on uh, your organizations. Definitely. And if you um, are in the um, arena or the space or the um, role in your laboratory where you're able to be innovative and create one, then you um, definitely should consider it. Um, all three of us have experience in this arena, so we'd love to connect with you and talk to you more about this. Hopefully we've given you in this short amount of time 
um, just a high level overview about career ladders. We've talked about this a couple of times, and I, I think um, in the 2023 E or 2022 ELMC um, conference for ASELS, we did a session on um, succession planning. So if you're a member of ASELS and can go back through their archives and listen to that presentation that we did at the Emerging Leaders Conference um, virtually, you might also find value from that. Um, until then, we enjoy, like we do every week, you know, talking to you guys, um, talking with each other and um, going over these topics and sharing the knowledge that we have. If you have more that you'd like to offer, definitely reach out to us. Make sure that every week you are tuning in for a new episode um, and connecting with us so we can continue to hear uh, what you would like to hear from our group. We enjoy hearing from you guys and we can enjoy um, connecting with you all. So make sure that you um, stay um, in tune with us and we'll stay in tune with you. Until next time, uh, we hope each and every one of you have the most wonderful week and we will be bringing you back a new episode next week. Goodbye. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Elaborate Topics where your hosts discussed relevant strategies for laboratory professionals. Please subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and listen to us on directimpactbroadcasting.com. Stay tuned for another episode with information you can use to excel in your laboratory career.